My time is a little shorter, so I'm going to just give you a little story. And the story, I'm going to have to take you back to somewhere that you've probably never been, because you, most of you are very young, to December 26, 1979. Okay? Some of you, maybe, the older ones, been there. December 26, 1979 is significant to me and my people. Um, while the West and most of the people in the world celebrated the day after Christmas, opening their toys, what have you, enjoying their life. In 1979, December 26, Afghanistan and its people completely changed forever. And over 40 years now, almost 40 years actually, there's been in turmoil, and that was the turning point for all of us. I was very, very, very young. I'm not going to give you a number, um, but I was very young. My family, all of us in, uh, in the capital in Kabul, were worried about my father because he never came home that night the night that Russians, the Soviets, attacked Afghanistan, the night that the tanks rolled into the capital of Kabul and brutally murdered the, the, the ruling party and, the entire, and his entire family and took over Afghanistan in a military coup. I remember being very happy. I was very young, post, uh, the, even after the the, the coup, things were calming down a little bit. Being very young and remember being very happy in Kabul, me and my sisters, uh, cousins, everybody lived in a very uh, nice neighborhood. We enjoyed our life. My father was in the Afghan national television. He was a producer. And uh, we had a normal life, you know, like any kid anywhere in the world, uh, Turkey, Syria, all over the world. And uh, uh, we had families, and we had movie nights, and we had, uh, would hang out and go have ice cream and have kebabs. Afghans have good kebabs, by the way. And uh, enjoy our life in like, every day. And uh, then a few years fast forward, 1985 rolls up, and uh, they were trying to, the government trying to arrest my father for his involvement in resistance. So my father had to flee. He left to uh, Pakistan. He ran away. If you're caught, by the way, that you're leaving the country without, uh, in, in a smuggled way, or you smuggling yourself out of the country, you will be caught and you will be dead. That's a fact. That's the communist regime, at least in Afghanistan. That was the case. So my mom, my sisters, uh, my younger sister was three and a half. I was just turning eight on that day. So I just dated myself. Dang it. Um, on that day... In 1985, it was my birthday, January 2nd, and we all, my family, my, my mom and uh, my sisters, we packed our bags, very small, because you can't show that you're leaving, so we just basically, our belongings were sitting in the house, we just locked the door, and we started to hire, my dad hired a, a smuggler to smuggle us out of the country uh, without problems, meaning paying people, bribing people throughout, so we don't get bothered. So we go, and... Uh, uh, to the border, near the border, there's an area called Jalalabad, and uh, I remember this vividly. I was wearing this kind of light blue Afghan outfit with my sister, and my mom said that you guys have to go alone. I cannot go with you guys because it kind of raises red flag. So that day, my sister, nine, and I'm eight, walking the border from Afghanistan to Pakistan with one guide. And my mom said, not to hang out, not, not walk, don't walk too close to that guy because they may suspect someone, uh, something about you. So you just have to walk as if like you're walking behind him, but keep an eye on his navy blue outfit. And that's what exactly what I did. Even at that young age, I knew this wasn't fair. Right away, I knew that wasn't fair. I knew that <clears throat> I deserved to be in Kabul when my family with my cousins, uncles, grandparents. It was happening to us. It's one thing that you get your passport, you get your visa, you go for vacation to whatever part of the world. But one thing, you pushed out of your own country for saving yourself. This was happening to us. And the reason I'm telling you this story is because humankind, human being, they're not just what you know of them. A refugee, for example. So that day, on January 2nd, 1985, my entire family became refugee just like that. Lost everything. Came to Pakistan. Some people think that Pakistan is very similar to Afghanistan. Yes, they have similarities. We share the same religion. 
but we're still very different. They were no cousins. We didn't hang out. We didn't speak the same language. We're new. And everybody knew, like, oh, that is a muhajir or a refugee. Everybody knew this. Everybody knew that we're different. We look different. We talk different language. It was very difficult as a young person, or even adults, to cope with something like this. It's not something that is pleasant at all. But one thing that we, we as, as refugees, that felt was the insecurities and invulnerability in a different land. And everybody trying to help you, don't get me wrong, we, there were a lot of help to come, but it was more of a sympathy. Oh, let me, look, let me help you. I'm so sorry you, this happened to you. But all the refugees generally want is to be understood, to know that our culture, our humanity, uh, is not reduced to the last few years. Afghanistan just didn't exist in the last 40 years. It's been around for literally 2,000 years. The people of that land have been there. The Prophet Muhammad spoke about Kabul, the city, in this one of his hadith. So we are from that land. We have history. People need to know this. So nowadays we see people in, in Turkey, a, a, a great host, a gracious host, to close to 4 million uh, uh, refugees from Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, and other places. When we see them trying to understand their humanity, when we see them trying to say, like, and picture their civilization, picture Damascus, what a wonderful place was this. Picture how historian talked about Damascus, the civilization, the people, the culture, the food. It's not, this not reduced refugees to their status currently. Anyway, so can I finish my story? In 1985, we came to Pakistan. We were involved in the resistance, like I said, my whole family was. In 1989, things were not getting better in Afghanistan, so we couldn't return. So my father decided that we all move to the United States. So we all moved out to the United States and California. And, uh, and there you go, new culture, new language, new people, <clears throat> new sets of mannerism, everything different. I remember walking in my first cl in class in, uh, in junior high, and uh, I uh, knock on the door, I said, uh, may I come in? All the students laughed at me. It's like, what do you mean, may I come in? You just come in. It's not something that people ask in the West when you go to school. So 30 years I lived in, 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 in California. I loved it. I, I'm very great, grateful for that. I'm not here to tell you my sad story. I'm actually very happy. Everything that happened to me made me who I am now. Two years ago, I accepted a position at TRT World, and I work with refugees mostly. And it's a beautiful thing. I, I, by any means, I don't want to sh share this to be a sad story. It's a great story for me because I take strength in that. Uh, last week, it was in Afghanistan, Kabul, returning, sleeping under the same stars of when I was a child and remembering all those times I was a kid running around the streets with my friends and playing and uh, training and a young, a young Afghans on journalism and on media, etc. And it reminded me of myself how important their stories are, that they tell their stories, not some journalism from the West come, especially from the West, and come and tell their stories and like, feel sorry for them. They were like, no, we have a different, different narrative. We will take our narrative ourselves. And that's the strength of resilience. And that's what's happening in Syria, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in other parts of the world. It just, the, 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 the important thing that for us to remember that Nothing that is human should be foreign to us. In America, not too long ago, when you were a permanent resident, you were not a permanent resident, you were a permanent alien, which is a very degrading. It's very degrading to call someone an alien or a foreign. It's, but now it's changing, so thank God for that. So the, I guess my, the essence of my story is that to always be em, embrace the other culture, experience them through their food, through their music, through their... Um, antiquity, whatever it may be, but embrace them. Thank you very much.